So yeah, thank you very much for coming to my presentation today about um, attribute-based access control in Drupal. Uh, this means a lot to me personally because this is a project that I've been working on for the last year and a half or so. And so the, the fact that I had the opportunity to just kind of talk about it and gush about this idea with you guys just makes me really excited and really happy. So again, thank you very much, very much for coming today. So let me introduce myself. My name is Josh. I'm a senior web architect at Pegasystems. I've been with them for about three years, but I've been working with Drupal since uh, 2011, and I've been doing PHP development since 1999. So I've been doing it for a little bit of time. Um, and it was my work at Pega where the access attribute-based access control kind of came about. I'm the tech lead on Pega Academy, which is a learning platform for Pegasystems uh, software platform. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Pegasystems were a software company and we provide uh, software solutions for really large institutions such as governments, and banks, and education, and uh, corporations. And we provide solutions for uh, customer engagement as well as, uh, as their operations. And so as you can imagine, because of that we have to accommodate all those different kinds of customers at Peg Academy. Um, or so with Pegasystems, our learning platform where people go, our customers go to learn the software, also has to be able to accommodate all those different kinds of people at all those different uh, organizations and institutions. And so, and that's the project that I work on is, uh, I'm the tech lead on Pega Academy, and a year and a half ago they came to me and said, like, hey, we're gonna wanna be supporting you know, internal contributors and external contributors. We wanna have classes, which is a mix of people. We also wanna have, we're gonna wanna have different kind of exceptions. Uh, for access, and so they came to me, I've been in this position before, and I'm like, ah, great, okay. There's no real perfect fit uh, for this solution uh, in Drupal right now, so uh, we're probably going to have to write something ourselves. And so, but before I get into that, um, I'm going to take a step back, and I'm going to talk about kind of where we are right now in terms of access control, the different access control paradigms uh, that are available to us, and the kind of different problems that they solve. Uh, and then I'm going to give an overview of what attribute-based access control actually is, uh, talk about where the Drupal community is right now in terms of implementing it, and then, spoiler alert, I'm going to give you a demo of a module that implements it. Uh, and then hopefully, hopefully, we have a lot of stuff to cover, I will have some time for questions at the end. All right, so let's talk about some access control paradigms. Um, these next few examples I'm giving a really, really broad overview of the paradigms. Uh, every single one of these has lots of different nuances, lots of different kinds of variants and changes, a lot of specialized for different organizations. So, but at a broad level, it's kind of a helpful way to, to look at access control in general. First one, we have access control lists. You've all heard of this before. This is probably really bare bones. It's literally a one-to-one -one relationship between a user and, and or some kind of entity and a resource of some kind. Very commonly used in networking. Um, not as commonly used by itself in software development. We've kind of moved past that, right? Um, but still used as part of other paradigms. One of those other paradigms is discretionary access control. This is the idea where I am the author of some content, um, and then at my discretion, I want to grant access to the content. So if you ever work with a Google document, or Microsoft Word, or even Unix, uh, all of these kind of follow the discretionary access control paradigm. The next paradigm is mandatory access control, often used with multi-level security. Uh, very common in government, you have like document classification, you have top secret or you know, uh, uh, confidential or secret. Uh, another one would be um, like subscription tiers. You have premium or basic or standard, and based on your subscription tier, you'll have access to different kinds of content. And then finally, the one that really needs no introduction, role-based access control. This is the one we've all been using uh, really since almost, I think, the beginning of Drupal, have some kind of roles and permissions system in place. So I don't really need to go into detail about this. We've all been using And so with these kind of paradigms in mind, we take a look at the different modules that are out there that are available to us and see kind of where they fit into these different categories. Um, we do have an ACL module. That's really an API module, though. Um, we have some two very popular ones that are called discretionary access controls, is content access and node access. Uh, and then, but I would say the vast majority of the popular ones, they kind of extend the role-based access control paradigm in Drupal. So that's where you get 
like the group module, which defines different scopes or domains uh, for roles and permissions, but it's still very much an RBAC paradigm. Uh, we have permissions by turn, which essentially turns taxonomy themselves into a kind of permission. Um, and then you also have workman access, which follows a similar paradigm where you can have taxonomy terms or menu items or you can create your own custom plugins. Um, but again, you're kind of extending the permission system in Drupal. And so let's kind of go through a common scenario we, we run into when we're dealing with role-based access control in Drupal. So here I have a hypothetical website. Um, it's not that hypothetical, it happens a lot. Um, so let's say here, um, you know, I want to create some content, some articles. So what do I need? I have a, a content author role to be able to create articles. So far, Drupal handles this really well. Uh, no big deal, no problem. New requirements come in, we need to be able to add some content moderation. We want to be able to review and uh, approve content. Okay, no problem so far. We're just going to add a content reviewer role. So far, so good. Drupal's hand handling this very well. Now we need to support some translations. We want to add some French. I mean, we're, we're opening a market in Canada, for example. Okay, no problem. Let's just add another uh, translation administrator role. So far, so good. You kind of see where this is going, right? Now we have a new one. So some of these articles um, can only be viewed by certain members of your organization. Okay, what are we going to do now? We want to keep it lean, so we're going to write a little bit of custom code. We're going to add a few more roles. We're going to add an employee. We're going to add a contractor, and we're going to add a partner. Okay, starting to get not great, but you know we can still we can still handle it. Our company is growing. We have some new departments. They want to write their own articles and have their own reviewers for their articles. All right? That's that's add some more roles. <laughs> we, have a, we have a marketing author, a marketing reviewer. Okay, you know now it's really getting out of hand, but we're doing okay as long as nobody wants any new functionality. Right, we're done. Okay, we have to start pushing back. Oh, but of course. Some of these authors in different departments want to grant access to some people who, you know, maybe aren't part of their department. They want to grant some exceptions. Um, and it doesn't have any particular role. So what do we do now? We're kind of scratching our head, okay? At this point, we're reaching for a custom module or uh, we're writing even more complex custom code. And this is where we often end up. You end up with a role explosion. Uh, you have a lot of complicated custom code in there that you're probably going to end up throwing away when you restart the project. Um, or you have a bunch of different modules in there that you kind of, you know, you have to write some custom code to get them to all play nice together. Um, not a great place to be uh, when trying to deal with access. It can really turn into a nightmare. Let's talk a little bit about policy-based access control. So, what is a policy exactly? Um, it's kind of a hard thing to define, so I really find it illuminating just to have an example to, to articulate. So, one example of policy would be Allow a user to have access to content um, if their user ID is equal to uh, the author ID of the content. So if you take this kind of logic or this concept here and you express it as a permission, it'll look like this. Allow the user to have con access to the content if they have the permission. Uh, edit own content. We can take this even further. If we want to express this kind of idea as a role, you would say, okay, allow the user if they have a content author role or the content editor role. And so uh, at, at its core, the definition of access policy is that it's very fine-grained compared to permissions and roles which are more coarse-grained. Uh, if you want to think of it another way, uh, policy is actually the logic that me as a developer, I would implement in my code in order to write a permission, for example. And so really when you're talking about policy-based access control, you're exposing that underlying logic uh, that you normally would kind of tuck away into a permission of some kind. Uh, and that's where you get a lot of the power. Because, because it's so fine-grained, and when you open this up to, in your software, you can have really fine-grained access controls by using policies. All right, I'm going to just talk a little bit of semantics right here. Um, for our purposes, because you might be wondering why am I talking about policy-based access control, but this presentation is called attribute-based access control. Um, for our purposes, there really is no difference. Uh, in Drupal because we have the role-based uh, access control system. Uh, but if we want to argue semantics, like if we take a step back and look at a high level, and in particular if we look at the definition as it was defined by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, there is a difference between the two. Policy-based access does incorporate roles and permissions into it. 
and also incorporates policies, of course. Whether you use attributes as part of that policy is really optional. You can, but you don't have to. Attribute-based access control, on the hand, at least according to NIST, is um, it's just you're just comparing attributes. It doesn't have really a concept of roles or permissions in the same way that an RBAC or policy-based access. So again, I'm kind of arguing semantics here. For all intents and purposes, um, they're really the same thing. In fact, if you look up the Wikipedia page, attribute-based access control, in parentheses to say, also known as policy-based access control. Um, but I'm mentioning this because uh, there's a lot of confusion online when you're looking this up. It can be kind of confusing. It's like, well, I'm not talking about policy. I'm talking about attribute. So it's kind of helpful to kind of have like an understanding of the two. Um, but just to level like level you for us, the same thing. Okay, so let's go back to that earlier example that I showed. You know, we end up with role explosion, a bunch of custom code, and a bunch of conflicting modules. How might we solve this with attribute-based access? Now, you know, with attributes, in our case, roles and permissions are fine. So we're going to end up with the same roles and permissions to start off. Not, not a problem. But we have that first curveball, right? Some articles need to be viewed by certain members of the organization. We wrote, before, we wrote some custom code, and then we uh, added some new roles. Well, with attribute-based access control, we don't do that. We add a new field called member type. And then say, OK, you know, this could be a text, uh, list text field. It could be a taxonomy term. It could be a custom field, it doesn't really matter. Uh, any kind of field that you want, uh, you just add that um, to your user. Okay, the next one, departments. Before we add a bunch of new roles for handling departments, now we, now we don't do that, we just add another field. We add a new department field. So you can see where I'm going with this, right? It's pretty, pretty straightforward. How about that last one? You want to allow the original author to grant access to certain users who might not fit into a normal paradigm. A couple options we can, we can do here. We can add an allow users field to the content, and we just, you know, like a user any reference field, and then they can have access to it. Or we can add an assigned articles field to the user. So we're assigning content to that person, and then they can have access. And that's the really nice thing about uh, attribute based access control is that it's very, very flexible. Um, and it's very intuitive because you look at the fields and you can have an idea of kind of you know, what the purpose is when you're looking at the content or you're looking at the user. And more importantly though, um, they, they can just match the structure of your organization and then they can grow as new requirements come in. You can just add new fields to your users or to your content in order to gain access. And so well, how do we get these fields, these users and content, how do we get them to all kind of talk to each other? Um, well, in a typical ABAC system, they all kind of follow a similar uh, architecture. If you look at other implementations, like of a role system, you're going to find common elements like roles and permissions, right? So not just, you know, not just limited to Drupal. Well, ABAC system is very similar to that as well. So if you look at other ABAC systems, you're going to see these common elements. First ones are going to be your subject, your object, and your environment as well. I don't have it on the slide, but environment is also um, uh, a factor as well. And a subject in Drupal would be a user, uh, an object would be uh, a node or a taxonomy term or a media item or something like that. Now with each of these uh, subject and objects, you have your attributes, right? This is A, B, A, C. Um, and then in Drupal, these are just fields. And it can be any kind of field that you want. Now this is where you start to do your comparison. You add your access rules. <coughs> And your access rules, look at the attributes on a user, look at the attributes on a node, and then you can ask a question with it. Like, does the user's department match the department of the content? Or any other kind of question that you want in terms of comparing those different attributes. And then finally, the last kind of core element is you have your access policy. Access policies essentially are containers for your access rules. And you can have as many access rules as you want in your uh, I'm uh, sorry, you get access rules as you want in your access policy. And you also can choose how you want your access rules to be validated. Do you want all your access rules to pass? Or is it okay if just one of your access rules passes? Um, and, uh, and with that, you can use to constrain access. Now, if you look at other implementations, there's actually a lot more you can do with this. Um, like, for example, XACML, which is a very popular implementation, also includes access policy sets, which is a collection of access policies. 
You can also have access policy advice or access policy obligation, which are uh, events that can happen before and after validation. But to kind of get the core APAC system, these are the four elements that you need. You need your subject object environment, your attributes, your access rules, and your access policies. And frankly, um, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, like I said, it's a really intuitive, straightforward system. Um, and if you want to learn more about it and kind of see the visual documentation, you can take a look at um, uh, NIS, the documentation released by NISD back in 2014. And also, if you want to take a look uh, at a fully featured implementation of it, you can take a look at XACML. Um, have some interesting documentation there. It is written in XML. So it's not the most fun thing to, to read or to parse, but um, the documentation is interesting uh, just for, for getting those ideas. All right. So that's the APAC in a nutshell. Uh, let's talk about where we are now in the Drupal community um, for implementing this paradigm. So when I started work back on this, um, back in spring of 2022, I was looking at just you know, some kind of solution for this. And I happened upon this thread and this one originally was about trying to kind of handle access um, with query access in particular in, in Drupal core. And as you can see, the title is like, they're actually referring to anti-type access alter, which I don't even think we use anymore. I think we replaced that with query tags alter. And I think that came out of this thread. Um, this originally started in 2010, um, and it wasn't until seven years later that someone first mentioned ABAC. And you can actually visibly see the whole topic the whole, of conversation just pivot away from clear, you know, query access. We're going to come back to that later. Let's talk about this. This is really cool. And I think it was in the early days of Drupal 8, actually. So this was a really ambitious goal uh, to get into Drupal Core, uh, Drupal Core uh, 8. And uh, you had a lot of really talented developers. Uh, the original developer of the group module actually got involved. I think he was going to be the original architect of this, uh, this new paradigm in Drupal. Uh, there's tons and tons of really interesting conversation. Um, and some prototypes came out from it as a Kanban board uh, project was started. I think they even got maybe some funding. Um, I think some articles written. Um, so this was really great. When I read this, I was like, okay, this is going to be something. I skipped all the way down to the bottom. Like, give me a link. You know, I want, I want to uh, use whatever they built. Um, but unfortunately, there wasn't really anything ready for production. Um, like, I said, like I said, lots of interesting projects were created and prototypes. Um, but really nothing feasible that I could use uh, at, that, at that point. So which was, that was really noticeable. Until this year, actually. Uh, this year at DrupalCon in Pittsburgh, um, they gave developers the opportunity to submit some ideas and they could get some funding uh, for those ideas and they could deliver them. And one of them was policy-based access and core. And uh, this was in June. <laughs> I started working on this back in spring of 2022, so I'm like, oh, just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit too late. Um, so but this is really exciting. It's, it's, uh, it's something that's been worked on by one of the original developers of the group module, who was very active on that initiative. And uh, he's porting his flexible permissions module uh, into core, and that's going to be the new uh, policy-based API. So this is really exciting. Um, to give a kind of high-level view of how this one works is you... Um, you can define different scopes for your, or for your permissions, uh, and you can also grant or revoke uh, those permissions dynamically. And that's where the, the access policy part comes in. Now, some of this sounds familiar, right? Because flexible permission is actually a dependency of the group module. And so he's incorporating some of those concepts already. Uh, so if you want to see this API, um, it's available. It's going to be merging into 11 pretty soon, I think. They're, they're wrapping it up right now. I think part of this got committed like the other day. Yeah, I think like this last week, right? Yeah. Yeah, I saw they were really close. Yeah, yeah. So, this is really, really promising. Um, I, I would love to see the community respond to this and start creating some really killer access control modules. So, this is really great. Um, but, like I said, I started working on this a year and a half ago. We also have the access policy module. This is a completely different approach uh, for the API. This is configuration-based. So you can download the module today. You can start configuring your access policies. And yeah, like I mentioned, um, we started this work about a year and a half ago. We went through about a year of developments. Um, it's an alpha. And we just released our first beta in September, and we're in beta 5 now. 
And what beta, beta means for us is that features are basically done. We're focusing on bug fixes, performance improvements, um, you know, finalizing of API, which we're pretty close to that. Um, and then uh, eventually just moving to a release sometime next year, hopefully first quarter of next year. So that's where we are. And so I'm happy to report we do have a few modules available to us that do fit the um, policy-based access control paradigm. And um, so this is the part of the presentation where I'm going to be a little theatrical. And I'm going to say, well, there's really th three things that kind of coalesce in the access policy module. The fact that ABAC uh, is so powerful, so flexible, because you can use whatever field you want. Two, Drupal just has a fantastic um, field API. Uh, you have all sorts of different fields already available to you. And third, just Drupal is a really powerful configuration API. When uh, you install the access policy module, you not only can implement the policy-based access control paradigm, you can implement all five paradigms simultaneously on your website. And so that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm not going to go through all through all five paradigms. I'm going to do three examples in the demo to show you how I can use the access policy module and how ABAC can allow me to implement an extended version of role-based access control by creating some gated content. I'm going to create a subscription tier level, um, mandatory access control, multi-level access. And I'm also going to demonstrate discretionary access control where I can create some um, you know, private recipes where I'm the original author and then at my discretion, I can share that content with someone else all using the same. So, I'm going to switch that and open my browser. All right, so I've set up the uh, Umami website right here. I haven't really done a whole lot to, to change it. Uh, I added a one role, added the subscriber role right here, and I added one user, John Smith, who's going to be my subscriber. Okay, so the first one I'm going to set up is going to be, actually, you all can see that okay, right? It's not too small? Yeah. Okay, cool. So the first one is going to be gated content. Now this is attribute-based access control, right? So it's all about fields, it's all about attributes. So I'm going to start with an attribute. So I'm going to go to structure. Well, actually, let's, let's, let's find some content first. All right, so I'm going to go to articles. And let's say these herbs, I want to make this gated content. And so what that means when I click herbs, I won't be able to see it and say, I'm just going to say, access denied, you're not a subscriber, you can't see the content. And so, unless I log in. So let's do that now. So, like I said, it starts with a field, so I'm going to go to content types. I'm going to add a new field to my gated uh, to an article. And call it Boolean. Say, okay, this is going to be gated. There we go. That's fine. All right, so I added my gated field to my article. Now let's set up the first access policy. So I'm going to go to people, access policies, and access policy, and I'm going to call it gated. All right, so access policies does support different entity types. It can support blocks, so you can kind of create like a simplified, even a simplified block personalization with this if you want. Um, you can do media, you can do content, of course, taxonomy terms. It also supports paragraphs. Um, but I just don't have paragraphs installed right now. And we have different access policy types. Uh, I'll show an example in a little bit, but just to stress, these aren't bundles. Um, there's been some confusion with that. I might have to rename it something else. But uh, what these are is like, you know, with access con attribute based access control, you can have permissions. You can also have um, attributes. And so in some cases, you want to have different configurations of attributes and, um, and sorry, access rules and permissions. For, like, for example, say you have some public content, it wouldn't really make sense to have an access rule to, or a permission to restrict public content. And so, like, with a public policy type, it doesn't have any access rules or permissions to constrain that, because it wouldn't really make sense. And so that's kind of the idea behind the policy types. I'll show another example. All right, so I'm going to choose group. This, this is the one you use most of the time. And I have my table here showing different operations. So I know with gated content, I want to allow subscribers to see it. So I'm going to grant them the ability to see it. You need content inside this policy. And this one, I'm doing an extension of role-based access control, so I don't need an access rule. And I don't want to hide gated content on queries. I'm going to show a custom message there. This is oops, only available to subscribers. I can't believe I typed that all right. Okay. 
All right, so that's my policy. That's all I needed uh, in order to restrict access. Next step, though, is I need to tell Drupal when am I going to assign this policy to content? How is it going to know? And so that's the next step. I'm going to manage a selection of this policy. So I'm going to add a selection rule. And I'll say gated. So choose a gated field. And if the gated field is set to true, then I want this policy to be assigned to that content. I have some other settings here, like, you know, not everyone should be able to make gated content, right? So you can hide this setting behind some permissions. But I'm going to just turn that off for now. I'll save that. There's my policy. All right. So I have my gated access policy set up. And let's go find some content and make it gated. I think I want to make that herbs content gated. So I'm going to go ahead and edit that. Here, I'm going to scroll down. Here's my gated checkbox. I'm going to choose that. I'll edit my content again, and you can see access has been set to gated right here. All right, so I'm going to prove it to you that they can't have access to it. So I'm going to log back out. I'm my anonymous user. I refresh the page, and I get access tonight. I'm going to say this is only available to subscribers. So this is great. Uh, also, if I go to articles, though, because it's gated content, I give a little teaser, right, saying, hey, like, oh, I want to click this. Oh, no, sorry, I can't. I'm not a login subscriber. But, so let's log in right now. I'm going to log in John Smith, because he is a subscriber. There we go. Go to my articles. And there I can see it, because I'm a login subscriber. And so there I was able to extend kind of the role-based access control, allowing me to write any new uh, code or anything like that. All right, so the next one is going to be mandatory access control, which again is multi-level security. And what I want to do is I want to, let's say I'm going to make this quiche. I want to introduce a subscription tier for, for these recipes. So you need to be a premium or uh, you know, some kind of subscription level in order to see this, this quiche. Maybe it's a family recipe and I don't want certain subscribers to see it. So let's go set that up now. Now again, right, it all comes down to fields. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to add a uh, new list field to my content. So I'm going to go to content types. Go to my recipes. Add a new field. And uh, do list integer. I'm going to call it uh, subscription. And do basic, standard, and preview. It's fine. Maybe that. All right, so that's the first part. Now I need to compare the subscription level of my content with my user, right? So I need to add a field to the user as well. I'm going to go to my configuration, down settings, manage fields, and add a subscription field to the user. Same idea, subscription. New basic, standard. So I set up my fields. That's all done. So now I need to set up my access policy. So go people, access policies, and access policy, subscription. Content again, group again. And now first I'm going to uh, edit my um, permissions. Oops, let's refresh it. There we go. Oh yeah, I didn't mention. So. You can see I have all these different permissions available to me. I have permissions to allow certain roles to assign access policies. Uh, if an access policy is an access rule, you can have certain roles bypass all those access rules. Maybe you have like a manager, for example. Um, deleting any content with this policy. Uh, if, the, if the policy has uh, observing any fields that are on the user, like in this case, uh, you can choose to hide or show that field to different roles. Because uh, you, know, you can't allow users to change their own subscription level, right? Um, yeah, of course, edit content, uh, view revisions, uh, view any content, of course, and then unpublish content. In this case, though, I'm just going to do view. There we go. And so the check mark means that he has full access to all content that has been granted the, um, the subscription access policy. So let's add our first access rule. So I'm going to do subscription. Now I have a few options available to me. I'm going to compare the subscription with the user, but I want to do it in a numeric way. 
So I want to say if the content is less than or equal to the uh, value of the field of the user, then grant them access. Um, or put it another way, the user's you know, subscription is higher or e is equal to or greater than the company. Right? Just the other way. A bunch of other options here you can do as well. Um, if there's no field value, you can choose if you want to allow, deny, or just ignore the access rule. In query settings, I want to assign the, uh, apply this, this rule to queries. Uh, you can choose which operations you want to constrain or not. Um, usually it's have a default, but it's going to be very helpful. And I'll save that. And now by making that change, you see this change from a check mark to limited. So this says, that, okay, they have access, but they're constrained by an access rule right now. And then I'm going to leave all these things intact. And I'll save that. Okay. Again, I need to tell Drupal when to assign this policy. So I'm going to go to uh, manage selection. Same idea, subscription. And if the subscription field has a value, then assign this policy to it. There we go. All right. So I set up my two policies. Let's make uh, this recipe right here. Let's give that a subscription tier. All right. So let's find the recipe. There we are. And I'm going to set this to standard so that if anyone has premium, they should be able to see it. Save that. I'm going to refresh the page. So John Smith doesn't have any kind of subscription, so he can't see the content. So let's give him a premium subscription now. So we go to John Smith. And we'll set him to premium. Now to refresh it, you can see the content. And so you can see, I'll be able to implement two completely different access control paradigms with one module. I just did uh, the mandatory or multi-level access control. So the last one is going to be discretionary access control. This is how you can create private content. Uh, then at your discretion, you can allow other people access to that content. All right, so I'm going to do this. And again, right, it always starts with fields. So I'm going to add a new field, content types in my recipes, and I'll add a new field, and it's going to be well, allowed users to. Okay. And we can do unlimited. And we don't want the anonymous user, so I'm going to check that. Okay. Now I'm going to go to people, and I'm going to create a new policy again. Call this me only. Choose content again. Now I'm going to create a private access policy. And you'll see some of the difference that happens when you choose that. Save it. All right, so you can see the table is quite different this time. There aren't as many checkboxes. And so what this means is that, again, also if you take a look at edit permissions, there aren't that as many permissions available for this particular policy type. So that's because this is primarily uh, an access rules based policy type. Um, and each one of these policy types is a plugin. So if none of these really work for you, you can just create your own policy type. And you can configure your permissions and your access rules um, any way you want for each of the different operations. So, okay, let's see here. So I added this new private policy type. You see it automatically added a new access rule, uh, authored by current user. And you can't remove it, as you can see, but you can configure it if you want. And so we added that allowed users field, so let's add that here. Allowed users. All right, so here's my access rule. See, so it generated for me automatically because it saw that field that I added. And so allowed users field has reference to the current user. And you can figure that. And I'm going to say, if this doesn't have a value, then just ignore this access rule. Delete everything that's here. And also, I want to say, OK, if any of these rules pass, then go ahead and grant them access. It doesn't require all of them to pass. Because no, that just wouldn't really make sense. All right, and I'll leave everything else here. Now again, the second step for this, right, was uh, when are you going to assign this content? And so we can take a look at those selection settings. As you can see, authored by current user, this, a selection rule is automatically added. And again, select, uh, uh, sorry, uh, authored by current user, the selection rules, these are also plugins. Every access rule is a plugin, I should stress that. So you can write your own plugins uh, for anything that you need uh, in access policy. And so, actually, I, I apologize. I kind of went right by those. Let me, let me show you some of the access rules and talk about them a little bit. Um, so let me add one more access rule just to show you. 
So as you can see, uh, there's a new access rule for pretty much every, almost every field being on your website. And there's also some access rules for fields, uh, for, for other elements too, like some environmental stuff. For example, like weekday range, you can make access rules like this. This is based on certain date and time of the day. And so you can really be very, very flexible with your access rules. Um, I mean, there's some questions like, well, what's the value of this one? Honestly, this is just kind of a flex, you know, to, to be honest. But like, look what you can do with it. That's really why I added it in. I'm sure some people will find some value for it. But it was a fun one to make. So, all right, so we, let's get back to uh, our me only access policy. Uh, yeah, manage selection. So, as you can see here, uh, this uh, selection rule. So, what this means is anytime they create a new recipe, this rule is going to be true, right? Because you're always going to be the original author of the content uh, when you create it, right? And so, um, here's one of the things that we also have to be aware of. So, we have these different access policies. We can also choose like which ones we want to assign first. Um, because this one's always going to be true, right? So I'm going to go to my content settings. And here you can change the order of your access policies, essentially giving them priority of which ones you know you want to assign first. Now in this case, me only is in the middle. Let's say every recipe is always going to be uh, private, so I'm just going to move that up. And so tell it's like, okay, uh, first of all, it's going to check if I have permission to assign this, and then it's going to check do my selection rules pass? If they do, then it's going to assign the, the me only access policy every time. So, and as you saw, you can configure that in many different ways. All right, so I'm going to save that. So now let's create a new recipe. Content. I'm going to create a recipe. Plus brownies. So 15 minutes. I'm doing this from a box this time, so it doesn't take me very long. And I'm an image. And uh, yeah, this one looks good. Let's add some text to that. It'd be nice to have that AI right now. I don't really use this long so. There we go. And I'm going to save it. All right. Let's edit it. As you can see, it's been set to me only. So this is a, a private recipe. And just to prove it to you that no one else has access to it, I'm going to go back uh, as John Smith. You can see there's no one other brownie recipe here. Well, not this one anyway. It's a different brownie recipe there. Uh, but you didn't see the new one that I created. So let's grant uh, John access to this recipe. So I'm going to scroll down here. John Smith. Save that. Refresh the page. And there it is. It shows up on my listing page. And I can view the recipe as John Smith. And so um, you can even take this further. You know, like uh, this one in particular, this was just showing, like, allow people to view the content. You can even add another field and say, oh, these are my allowed editors. And then you can add a user to that. And so then you can have literally a full featured discretionary access control uh, right with, right, just using Drupal fields. These are my allowed authors or allowed editors, and here are my allowed viewers of the content. So you can really get that granny. Right? And so there's one thing, maybe. You're not really a big fan of having all your fields kind of intermingled with your content. I wouldn't blame you. I wouldn't really like that either. I'm probably going to be installing field groups, right, toward, to kind of section them off. But we do have an option for that as well. So if you go to People, uh, Access Policies, uh, this whole time I've been doing this demo in dynamic mode. And what this mode means is, um, and I actually went back and forth on, I called it discretionary mode. and. Um, automatic mode. I settled on dynamic mode, and it's not going to change, I promise. Um, so dynamic mode basically is based on if you assign a field value to it, um, then assign this policy based on that field value, like you saw with selection rules. Um, but we also have manual mode. And, oh, that's never happened before, I promise. There we go. There we go. You didn't see that, it didn't happen. Um, we have manual mode as well, and this actually inverts the whole kind of process. So instead of providing a field value, you can choose your policy first, and then you provide the field value. And I'll show you what that looks like. It'll make sense just soon. All right, so I'll choose manual. I'm gonna save that. Now I'm gonna go on access policies. By switching to manual mode, I now automatically added a new setting here, access tab settings. Let's show the widget, and let's do auto-complete. A highly visual widget, that's good. 
and save that. And let's go to subscription. Over here, access tab settings, show the widget, and yeah, that's fine. All right. Now if I go back to my recipe, my brownies, if I scroll down, those fields are gone now. Subscription and the allowed users field is no longer visible on this form. Instead, I have this new access tab at the top. And then you see it shows the select list with the current policy that's been selected, and along with the field associated with it. And then you can go ahead and change the policy, and it groups the fields right below it. Like that. And so, and that's pretty much it. Um, Oh, 340, I can't believe I got through everything so quickly. Um, so with that, that kind of concludes my demo and my presentation. So I'm actually happy we have time for questions. So thank you very much. Do you have a slide for that? All right. You go ahead. Uh, have you t tested this at s scale? Yeah, it's running on Pega Academy. Performance. Yeah, yeah, we have 70,000 active users on that site. Okay. Every day, yeah, so. Yes. And, um, yeah, so yes. yeah, definitely on scale. Yep. Okay. We definitely, uh, like I said, we're, we're focusing on performance improvements. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're focusing on that right now, just trying to make it work even better. But um, we have far worse things going on in Academy <laughs> than actual policy, fortunately, or, or unfortunately. That was my first question. My second question is, you, you kind of answered this, but I want to be clear. So mm -hmm. since we're talking about recipes, could you, for example, prevent access? Like if somebody creates an account, then the like, I'm allergic to nuts and this and that. Can you exclude recipes based on, rather than, rather than well, I guess you could just know the view. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think of like a more unique like content structure that would affect that, but yeah, that's already you know. <clears throat> we we have oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, I mean finish answering this question. No, no. Well I was thinking like we did run into one situation, it's probably not exactly related, but it is kind of a unique permissioning. Um, we had one issue where if the content was assigned to like this is available to types, we do not want to allow them to make it public even though they would usually be able to make content public. So it's kind of, think of it like a workflow transition. Mm -hmm. We had that kind of concept that we had to implement. And so what we did there, it's not exactly, but it's a similar thing. What we did there, we just added a new selection rule, saying if this is, you know, it's, it's restricted by memory type, um, then you can't change it to public, for example. So that was a kind of a workaround. My question is like a total tangent, but you were using a browser plugin to like create. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Um, I don't remember what that's called. I've been using it for so long. Oh, okay. Um, let me see. <laughs> yeah, I could not survive without that. Um, I used to use one, and then it got pulled from the Google Marketplace. I don't even remember. Um, okay. I'll, I'll look it up. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll get it to you. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> I have a question uh, still about performance. Like I saw you make a separate uh, checkbox, like to uh, filter content in queries, like entity queries. Yes, like, that's right. uh, uh, And if we like assume we have a use case when we will uh, have kind of private content and uh, exceptionally give access uh, to some users, like will not. Should I worry like to have some performance issues? Like if I have a lot of listings? Yeah, like, I'll be some... totally like open about the query is easily the most difficult, the most challenging in terms of performance. Um, there's a lot of kind of variables involved, like the way you do your joins, you can end up with duplicates. Yeah. And so we had to do some things like add some subqueries under certain situations and in order to accommodate for that. Um, again, I hear subqueries, I'm sure some of you are cringing right now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's easily the most complex part um, that is not fully resolved yet. Um, just to give a little spoiler, I'm gonna just spoil it a little bit. Uh, so one of the major initiatives that I'm doing um, after 1.0 is I'm gonna be introducing like the access policy access records module, which is going to pre-compute all of the access. I'm just oversimplifying it, but it's gonna be kind of like node grants, essentially. Um, but it's gonna be specialized for using with access policy so you can 
what it's going to do is going to allow you to do a very simple join on a table, pre-compiled data, and it should be very fast for it. Um, if data is out of date, then it's going to fall back to queries. Mm -hmm. um, so you're going to have, it's, it's going to be like, yeah, it'll be performant, um, but unfortunately, it's just kind of how it is. Yeah. I see it ends yeah. <coughs> So I does a spoiler. Um, yeah, so sounds, sounds good. Like, it take a while. <laughs> yeah, probably related question. Like, uh, I, I assume that you must uh, like have uh, a lot of varia variations of cache. Like, if you have, you need to add that, uh, that's the next user thing. Context, yeah. the context. That's the next thing we're working on as well. Um, right now, is is uh, using uh, user cache context, which is an ideal, and it's using uh, permission context, uh, depending on uh, which kind of access policy you build. I'm working on an access rule cache context right now. That'll probably be coming before uh, the other one. So, yeah. And also, when the access policy API lands, I'll be taking a look at that as well and see what parts of that I can incorporate into this module. Cool. Yeah. yeah, so like I said, focus is on performance right now. All these things I'm very aware of. Yeah, and the last thing I want to add, like, it's a uh, probably biggest discovery for me for this camp. So like, awesome. I love the module. Like, that, love that's them. great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, hope uh, hopes all the problems. Yes. So there's there's kind of that axiom that you're not really supposed to try to have your cake and eat it too and mix and match and use a whole bunch of different access control modules all at once because then yes. gosh knows what's happening. Um, but you know, since you contextualize this by talking about uh, Chris John's field permissions going to core mm -hmm. and concerns about like, you know, users kind of maybe wanting something from there, but something from yours, or maybe someone's coming in and they're going to use single sign-on grouper permissions or something instead, but then they kind of want a little piece of what you've yep. got too. Like, is there any way that you can envision, you know, <laughs> a world where these could be used together at all or not? Oh, all well, the different modules yeah. working together? Yeah. Um, maybe, if, if they collaborate, <laughs> I suppose. Um, yeah, that was definitely one of the things. And in fact, like, kind of discovering that this module could do those different paradigms, something I discovered really late in the game. It's like preparing this presentation, I was like, I realized, like, oh, actually, I could do all this with this module. I didn't even realize there's a different paradigm. So I don't want to toot my own horn or anything like that, but like, as far as I know, it's the only one that really can do that. Um, but I'm sure, like, um, I maybe look at the group module, as, uh, and the, the maintainer of that, and he really knows his stuff. Um, and yeah, let me say he's doing the, uh, the access policy API. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it.